again, I just like to um, thank most sincerely all of our patient participants who are joining us today and who submitted questions for this talk, so for this talk in advance. And we're going to take a very different approach to a presentation this morning. So what I've done is um, I've collated the eight absolutely brilliant questions that I received on this incredibly important issue, women's issues in thrombosis and anticoagulation. Um, and I've divided them into a couple of thematic areas. And what I'm going to do is uh, address the questions and then show you some data, some slides, some um, key uh, take home messages and to answer each of your questions. And then at the end, if there are any additional questions, um, I'd be honored to go through the, those also. So without further ado, it's important to uh, highlight my disclosures, which are that I hold a uh, research grants from the HRB um, and SFI and investigator initiated grants from the following companies paid to the university, which are not relevant to today's presentation. So um, without further ado, question one that we received was as follows. I would love to ask about the solutions for heavy periods and low iron pylon apixaban. I've tried the marina coil and recently also prescribed Cerazet, but nothing working so far, unfortunately. And also recent, really interested to hear about HRT. So thank you um, to that patient who submitted question one. I'm gonna address the first part of your question in the first part of the talk and HRT will be addressed later on, um, I think in the second part. So, and, uh, and th this, just so that you know, um, I'd, I'd encourage all of you to, um, if you have time, to um, join the session um, tomorrow um, in which uh, we have a patient video um, highlighting exactly this experience um, produced by Thrombosis Ireland and Anne-Marie O'Neill and, and delivered by Ms. Anne Bidos, um, so bravely sharing her story um, on this precise issue. Um, and it'll be followed by a talk by world expert in the area, Dr. Uh, Bethany uh, Samuelson Bano. So I'd encourage all of you to join that. So what do we mean when we talk about heavy periods? Well, um, the, the, the definition um, is that we were actually talking about abnormal uterine bleeding and abnormal uterine bleeding includes things like heavy periods or heavy menstrual bleeding heavy and prolonged menstrual bleeding, so going on for longer than should, prolonged menstrual bleeding and bleeding in between periods. So that's kind of what we mean when we talk about abnormal uterine bleeding. And it is incredibly relevant because young women, uh, people who have periods, um, will obviously have a higher chance of experiencing bleeding um, as, as a consequence than when we add on to that um, a blood thinner, so an anticoagulant, no matter what that blood thinner is. And even outside the area of blood thinners, like, like our patient has asked about, we, we know that heavy menstrual bleeding or heavy periods affect like 20% of women during their childbearing years, um, even in the absence of anticoagulants. And just, we define this as being greater than 80 mils per blood loss per menstrual cycle. But perhaps an even more important definition for ego is abnormal uterine bleeding that disturbs the physical, emotional, social, or material quality of life. We just had a phenomenal, truly inspiring talk by Dr. Byrne who, who highlighted the potential emotional um, and psychological effects of um, both thrombosis and coagulation abnormalities on people. And as this patient highlights, heavy menstrual bleeding is so often overlooked um, as an adverse effect of anticoagulation. And as an outcome, it's often forgotten about during clinical trials. Um, we know that it has an overall negative impact on women's quality of life and that it incurs direct and indirect costs to the woman and society both psychological and other in terms of being able to work and being able to function and um, get on with your life in a way that you enjoy. Um, and we know that 
people who are anticoagulated and um, with all sorts of blood thinners, um, but in particular DOX for venous thromboembolism, do include a younger demographic compared to those receiving anticoagulation for stroke prevention. And of course, you know, people have a lot to gain from the advantage of that DOX has to offer on one hand. But that's sometimes balanced by having a lot to lose from the reduced quality of life associated with um, associated with um, heavy menstrual bleeding on the other. And that's why this patient's question is so important. If there's any way that we can manage and find that balance and, and just even raise awareness of it um, so that we can potentially find some mitigating solutions, well, that's really important. Um, so we'll talk about... so. The, the patient quite rightly asked about solutions, and um, so it's it, you know we, we're not perfect yet in terms of the knowledge base and the evidence base, and there's certainly a lot of knowledge gaps. But it's really helpful to think about um, this abbreviation from FIGO when we think about the causes of abnormal uterine bleeding, because all of them can potentially be useful. So some of them can make some of these physical causes like polyps and other things that can be within the uterine cavity can make bleeding worse. Um, the uh, C there is called coagulopathy. And that's what I think we, we you know, experience when anticoagulation is added to a woman's life um, who is menstruating. So that is the one that is relevant here. But of course, if you have very, very heavy periods um, of normal uterine bleeding with anticoagulants, it's quite possible that they're I mean, it's really important to look for physical contributing things as well and to correct um, iron deficiency, absolutely crucial. So um, how do we investigate, how do we manage abnorm abnormal uterine bleeding in women who are taking anticoagulation and who have heavy periods? Well, first of all, we as doctors must ask we, we must ask the question because um, I know I know that there are lots of women out there who maybe are not asked the question and that is a common experience. Um, so we uh, work with you to take a history and do a physical examination to figure out if um, this, if the periods that you're experiencing, you know, are, are something that we need to do better with. And that's really important. So you should always ask about how long your periods last. And it's great to be able to have this information in advance of your consultation so that you can raise it if it's not asked about specifically frequently. So how often you have periods. Um, it's important that your doctor checks your, if you are having very heavy periods, your um, hemoglobin or your blood count and iron level so that we can do something very simple, but which can be transformative. And that is correction of iron deficiency. Um, iron deficiency is very common, as you can imagine, when you're losing a lot of blood. But um, of course, we need to address the causes of the heavy periods, but we must not forget to fix uh, the deficiency in iron that you're experiencing. That in itself can impact very severely on quality of life. And just to point out that iron can be very difficult to take orally at the proper dose. And a lot of it's been shown by excellent quality studies that taking it every second day um, is a very, very useful strategy for lots of reasons that have been proven. And we know the mechanism. Um, for occasionally, for women who absolutely can't um, tolerate oral iron, occasionally we do give it um, intravenously or parenterally, um, and, that, and we shouldn't be afraid to do that. So, if I can share my video now. I don't think I can, I'm right. We'll try again later. Um, investigation. No, so, can't see it. Sorry. Don't okay. worry. Don't worry. Just have to imagine this lovely T-shirt that Anne Marie has uh, provided. So the next, um, the next thing we will do is investigation. So there could be more going on than just the blood thinner, um, and of course the blood thinner may have unmasked maybe bleeding due to a gynecology cause. So do you remember we we talked about palm coin? So if there was, for example, a, you know, a fibroid or a polyp, our gynecology colleagues, and we work very closely with Tunda here, um, will be involved in order to try to address it. 
there may be a need to do an ultrasound or another type of X-ray investigation, radiological investigation, but um, that'll depend on the outcome of your, your consultation with the gynecologist. And finally, um, we don't have a huge amount of high quality data, but the, the solution in addition to fixing iron deficiency is to consider very personalized approaches. And this will depend um, from patient to patient. So some women will be suitable for um, considering what we call tranexamic acid or an antifibrinolytic. And it is sometimes the balance of risks if it's not too close to the time of the clot can favor um, using tranexamic acid. Um, certainly for the early parts of the period, but this should be led by a, a hematologist with, with considerable expertise. And, you know, after weighing up of, of your own personal risks, including, you know, what you've been through in history. And sometimes we know from studies that have been published that in lots of um, centers around the world, doctors sometimes choose to work with um, women who, affect, who, who are affected by heavy menstrual bleeding. And sometimes um, maybe changing the anticoagulation for amending the dose if that's if that's appropriate and if it's within guideline recommendations it can be helpful but um, it's also important to ask if there is a clinical trial that you can be um, recruited into or that might be suitable for you and I'm delighted to report that um, through the Irish Network for VT Research we will shortly in collaboration with the UCG Clinical Research Centre and the International Network for VT Research Network be beginning the recruitment to the Medea trial. And this multi-center, multinational um, randomized trial, academic randomized trial will address this precise question and will finally provide um, at the end of the study, some high quality data finally to address this question. And um, we are deeply grateful to the principal investigator of this study, Professor Saskia Middledorf in the Netherlands. So we will, if there are any additional questions on this incredibly important issue, we might take them at the end of the um, presentation. We'll move yeah, on. No further questions on that one. Perfect. So we'll move on to uh, the second set of questions. I'm going to read them out for you, but they're, they're highlighted by maybe this um, hypothetical scenario. A 25-year-old woman asks her doctor for a prescription for the contraceptive pill. So there were three questions that were, and, and you know, and actually she tells her doctor that she was diagnosed with a deep vein thrombosis for which no cause was found three years ago. There were also three real life questions from our patient participants that were shared through Facebook and through Anne Marie and Thrombosis Ireland social channels during the week. So again, thank you. Number one, why do the newer oral contraceptive pills have a higher risk of thrombosis than the older ones? And as we we'll go through this question, and um, it's to do with the content, um, or can I take and can I take the pill while on anticoagulation medication? Fantastic question. Um, the second question was: There is an advertisement on the TV in the UK for a new pill called Hana that is available with a description. It contains progesterone and desogesterone. Is it safe to use it? Well, at progesterone called desogesterone. Is it safe to use it? And finally, I'm on anticoagulants for life. I badly need HRT, but my doctor is not happy to prescribe it for me. Is there a particular type of HRT that is safe for me? Does warfarin protect me from getting a clot if I take it? Okay, so let's start going through these. Um, so combined oral contraceptives contain estrogen and progesterone, and they are extremely widely used across the world. They do result in a, an increased, what we call relative risk in VTE risk, but the absolute risk is truly tiny overall. And overall, in terms of the protection that these um, agents provide women and the ability to control your fertility, and of course, um, the much higher risk of thrombosis that we experience during pregnancy. There's no question but that on a population level, they, they are safe and they are effective. Um, and to put it in perspective, um, so a woman in her 20s might have a one in 10,000 chance of having a VTE. And so if you increase that even to you know, five-fold, six-fold, you still 
I think there's an estimated risk that is five to six in 10,000, and that is very, very tiny. Okay. So, um, oops. The, these agents contain both estrogen and progesterone. And in a, addressing the first patient's excellent question, the risk does vary and has varied over the years and most recently um, due, to the change, due to changes in the dose of estrogen, ethanol, estradiol, usually, and progesterone type. Um, so uh, the dose of ethanol, estradiol used to be really, really high in the earliest runs, you know, in the 1960s. Um, it, sorry, before the 1960s, it was up to 150 micrograms. In the 60s, that came down to 50 micrograms. And then subsequently, the, the amount of estrogen in these pills has you know, success, success of years is now you know, down to you know, 20 to 30 micrograms. And, um, and certainly, we know that this reduction in the dose of estrogen, ethanol, estradiol, was indeed associated with a reduction in the risk of uh, venous thrombosis. But um, I suppose in parallel, um, there has been, you know, ch there have been changes in the type of progesterone, progestogen compound in these pills, really in an effort to reduce side effects and make, make it easier for women to take these medications and to avoid and um, to have control over their fertility. Um, so first generation progesterones were uh, norethesterone, north things like that, and nestrol. And newer progesterones were developed, and they were called second generation companies. Levonorgestrel and third generation ones progesterone, and desogestrel, and norgestrel. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. We, we, we have been seeing a higher risk of venous thrombosis with third generation agents compared to second generation agents. So, to answer the patient's excellent question, it is down to the components and the hormonal components of the central. The patient who asked about the pill in the UK called HANA. So HANA is available um, over the counter in the UK, but not available over the counter in Ireland. It contains 75 micrograms of desergestrel, which as you'll remember from what I've just said, um, is, is a type of progesterone, all right? So um, yeah, it, it, I suppose for, we know that the progesterone only pill is, um, not associated with an increase in VTE risk um, and certainly may be useful for some women who are at very high risk of thrombosis. Um, just, just bear in mind that it has to be taken at precisely the same time every day. And maybe as you'll hear tomorrow from Dr. Daniel Simbano, the contraceptive efficacy, just have to remember that um, it may not be as so, you know as effective as the combined pill, which is a lot more forgiving, which is why I think many, certainly in my practice and um, with my patients, and certainly internationally, I know from, from um, experts in the field, that most, many women after consultation will, will elect to receive levonorgestrel releasing intrauterine devices. And these are, you know, coils a bit like the Marina, you know, such as the Marina coil, the JDS coil, such uh, as Kylina coil, you'll be familiar with these terms. And these re release progesterone or levonorgestrel locally and to a lesser extent into the blood. And we know from large studies that they are not associated with an increased first risk of VTE. For women who've had a VTE event, like the woman that I, uh, whose case, whose hypothetical case I presented at the beginning of the presentation, um, there's lower quality data, obviously, because the numbers are smaller, um, but it doesn't seem to be associated with significant increased risk of recurrent VTE either. So um, women um, who've had a previous thrombosis, if they're, you know, rather than not using any contraception and having the pregnancy-related uh, risk of thrombosis, having control over fertility is so, so crucial. And then two of our patients asked about HRT. So hormone replacement therapy comes in many different types uh, of formulations and are as a class extremely effective in the relief of menopausal symptoms. And again, they are like the oral contraceptive pill associated with 
a two to three fold approximately increase in BCE risk. And it's, I suppose, because women taking HRT are slightly older, they would be predicted to have a high, they do have a higher baseline risk of thrombosis just because of age. And therefore, when you multiply that by two to three fold, the absolute risk is going to be higher. Isn't it? Having said that, um, they're still advocated for women as a, you know, around the world who have menopausal symptoms, and I would very, very much support that. But here is the important part. Personalized decision making is so crucial, um, is so, so crucial in this area. Um, and our patient who asked the question said that she was on anticoagulants for life, that she badly needed HRT. Um, so what, what might be safe for her? First of all, she and another patient asked about um, staying on hormones while on anticoagulation. And if there during, so if a young, you know, if a woman is, is taking anticoagulation, let's say for the acute phase of a, of a thrombosis, so she's destined to be on anticoagulation for three months, we do have data um, showing us that actually being on hormones is safe during the time that you're on anticoagulation and is recommended by current guidelines. Um, it is um, important of course, that to remember that if you stop and to, if you stop um, the combined pill abruptly when somebody has a blood clot and they're on anticoagulation, that they will have a breakthrough bleed and that could be very um, debilitating for your patient. So it is very safe to stay on um, hormone treatment while the phase of anticoagulation is ongoing. But then we need to meet and make a, make a plan for when anticoagulation is stopping, if it is stopping. Now, the lady who asked this question is, I think, going to be on anticoagulation for life. And I think she's in a life phase where she is looking at HRT. Um, so we do know that there are options. And this is why this is why emphasized decision making is so important. So transdermal estrogen or the estrogen patch, you can discuss it with your doctor and um, because Transdermal estrogen has been reported to be associated with lower and in, in many studies, no increased risk of first BTE. We have, of course, lower, high, high, lower quality data for um, recurrent thrombosis. So for women who had a blood clot and um, who have stopped anticoagulation and don't want to have another one, but um, still it does appear to be safe. And certainly we have to, we have to weigh up the um, competing risks of not being on HRT for women who need it um, from a psychological and um, overall health, holistic health perspective, and of course, um, from, a, from a healthy lifestyle perspective. What do we think about when we share decision-making um, doctors and patients? Well, we look at um, things that might increase your own risk of developing a VTE, such as a strong family history of thrombosis. Um, we talk about whether you have a personal history of thrombosis and whether you have thrombophilia or indeed other risk factors for thrombosis. Um, and all of these things are absolutely crucial to bear in mind. So that addresses, I hope, um, the absolutely brilliant questions, numbers two, three, and five that were proposed by our patient participants. I wonder if there are any, Quick look and see if there are any questions relevant to this section. Um, I think there is. Yeah. Yeah. I think this okay. might be. Okay. I'm on. I'm on warfarin for three years. Quite a high dose, twelve milligrams a day, for numerous DVT and PE. However, now trying for my first baby and finding it hard over a year and a half of, of nothing. Doctor said warfarin is fine to try conceive, but come off after conception. However, I'm not sure as lots of family also on different blood thinners are telling me to change as it might have better chance of pregnancy. I'm not sure where to go from here as in does warfarin lessen the chances of conceiving? Okay, it's a great question and my heart goes out to you. Um, and what I would say is I, I, I hope that you're linked in with a, a, a team, so your obstetrician and your gynecologist, but also a hematologist with an interest in, in thrombosis. Um, so we don't have 
good data to suggest that warfarin itself would um, decrease the chance of you conceiving per se. But of course, it's really important to have a very important conversation around, um, you know, safe conception. Um, I don't know the name of this um, patient who's asked the question, but, you know, we, we know that after, um, after the sixth week, um, warfarin can be dangerous in pregnancy because it crosses the placenta. So once you have um, some some women elect to switch to warfarin, which um, can be taken during pregnancy in advance of the pregnancy. I have to say that in my practice, my after shared decision making, a lot of my patients will elect depending on what anticoagulant there are. There's so few few women on warfarin now, and of course, the indication for the warfarin is going to be crucial to to tease out. So if you are on warfarin and you want to become pregnant, have that conversation. Um, and it's, you know, things to bear in mind would be, you know, are your periods regular, regular pregnancy tests so that you know that you're pregnant early on and, and you know, switch and have a, a system in place to switch rapidly to um, a safe anticoagulant during pregnancy, if that is what is relevant for you. But of course, um, it's important to have a conversation with your care providers, your specialist care providers to find out um, the underlying reason for being on that warfarin you know, is it is it a blood clot or is it something that you know is it something else? Um, because there are some rare conditions that, that can you know, can be dangerous during pregnancy. So someone are attention and um, to, to you know say one of them, but really have that conversation and find out number one, due to your condition, is it okay to become pregnant? But number two, um, then have a plan, action plan well in advance. So that brings us beautifully onto our third story, which addresses three of our questions. Um, I have a history of blood clots, but I'd like to have a baby. Is it safe for me to get pregnant? And for this patient's question, um, we look after many, many women every year and um, through our collaborative, um, through a collaborative clinic in the Rotunda Hospital with my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Donnelly, my maternal medicine service. Um, and with, with good care, yes, you, you can absolutely um, consider um, pregnancy. And the next question is, I am pregnant and just learned about my risk of blood clots. What are the signs to look out for? Absolutely brilliant. And what do I do if I get symptoms? And finally, we'll touch on aspirin because this patient, the third question is around aspirin. And um, we use aspirin after joint surgery to protect people from clots. In, 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 I'd qualify that by saying, you know, people who are at lower risk in some centres. Why is aspirin not used more widely? And we have a little bit of news on that front in terms of a trial that's starting. So um, this patient, um, this hypothetical quest patient um, fulfills some, you know, raises some of these issues for us. She developed a PE three years ago while taking the pill. So she'd have a um, lower risk when she's, you know, when she's not exposed to hormone treatments. And that risk, unfortunately, comes back up again when she's pregnant. So... Um, what do we need to consider? What do we need to bear in mind? Um, I'd like to just anchor myself to, to the brilliant question eight, which was the signs to look out for, because this is probably one of the take home message of the, of the entire session. You know, the, know your signs save a life. The signs of a pulmonary embolism can be so varied, our shortness of breath, um, chest pain, sometimes coughing up blood, sometimes feeling faint, um, and sometimes collapsing, but can be very innocuous. And as Dr. Byrne said, trust your body, never ignore your body, get checked out. Symptoms of a deep vein thrombosis can be leg swelling, leg pain, um, and it can be your entire lower limb, your entire leg during pregnancy um, because of the way that the, the womb lies and the, the kind of anatomy of the blood vessels within your pelvis. Um, and it tends to be more on the left side than the right in pregnancy, but um, it's still really important to bear in mind. So to address all three questions, we know that the risk of venous thromboembolism is increased during pregnancy and after childbirth. And that is why it's so important to know your risk factors, know your risk when you're pregnant. And in answer to the patient's um, question she asked and um, I'm told I must take it for six weeks after delivery why surely once the baby is born the risk decreases 
And this is so important because actually the risk is highest after a baby is born. And we know that from a lot of really high quality studies, including this one by Sultan et al. And we know that um, that risk can persist even as long as six weeks postpartum. Why is this important to know? All three patients have asked this question. It's important to know because we need to identify who is high risk, especially after baby is born. We need to discuss um, together ways that we can reduce your risk, including picking out those people who are at, those women who are at high enough risk to need something done about it, so to reduce their risk as long as possible. And the majority of women will not need this, but for those who do, it is important because risk assessment can save lives. And there are lots of things that can increase the risk of ETE during pregnancy. And one of them is having a cup to sit in the pot. But other things can include such um, events as being very sick or having nausea and vomiting during your pregnancy, having a cesarean section, having a very bad infection, and amazingly having a major hemorrhage. We showed this in a large study in the Rotunda Hospital. And it was amazing because actually knowing your risk factors is so crucial. Four in five women had at least one risk factor in the study. And um, the, the most people who have only one risk factor will, of course, not require any change to their management. But it's important to know when you have multiple risk factors, because that can mean that you need extra care, sometimes with the administration of a blood thinner, particularly after baby born. More than two or in five had two or more risk factors, and one fifth of women developed risk factors during delivery for the postpartum period, which is why it's crucial to repeat this risk assessment in the postpartum period. Because otherwise, we don't know. So that's key take home message, know your risk, be involved, know the signs, save lives. Working together, we definitely need more data to answer these important questions. And um, relevant to the patient who had had a previous and um, we will soon have data on what the best way to prevent a blood clot is in pregnant women who've had a previous blood clot. This was a multinational study called PILO, led by Professor Middeldorf in the Netherlands. Over 1,000 women were recruited and it will report very soon. And finally, uh, relevant to the patient who asked about aspirin, this very question is going to be addressed very soon in a trial that will compare aspirin into placebo in women who have had their baby. And I am keen, to, I'm coming to the end of my time and I'm keen not to uh, leave out any um, questions. So I can certainly skip by the last few slides and just highlight one message, which is that working together is so important if you have had a DVT or PE during your pregnancy. And there will be a Really, um, the, the key thing is to have a team of multidisciplinary colleagues around you and working with you. So take home messages, awareness, spot the signs, save a life, risk assessment, know your risk. Get involved in the Thrombosis Ireland website and campaign and, and let's learn more together, spread the word. Work with your doctor. Shared decision making is so crucial. And of course, hormones can increase risk, but overall, don't be afraid of them because the benefits are so important. Thank you very much. And I think we have addressed a lot of questions. Thanks to your patients who entered their questions even in advance of today's uh, talk. So there might be time for one more. Yeah, there's, um, so Nora asks, um, if I've had a hysterectomy and both ovaries are out and allowed, am I allowed to go on HRT? I'm on Eliquis. It's so she's had a history of blood clots. She's on Eliquis uh, because of blood clots. So the first thing to say is that because she's on Eliquis, um, she, you know, from a thrombosis perspective, um, again, talk to her doctor, but there, there, shouldn't, there, there shouldn't be an issue in Nora from a thrombosis perspective. 
I would also strongly urge you to talk to your gynecologist just to make sure that there isn't any other reason um, that you can't be on MHRT. But it sounds like it is being recommended for you, and that sounds like um, a very reasonable solution. Um, so you're on Eloquus. Now again, there are lots of pieces to your story that that are I, you know that I, I don't know, and I would never. Um, you know, I'd always say, you know, and make sure that you enter into a shared decision making process with your doctor to find out the best solution for you. Right. So you're not putting it out. She just has to speak to her doctor and look at all the different options. That's right. And um, thank you so much, Henry. Now, I just have one more question. Um, there's a history of blood clots in our family. Um, and I've been to the doctor and my doctor has prescribed Cerazet my GP, Cerazet uh, pill. I'm just wondering, is that a safe pill for me to use? Yeah, so that was one of the pills that we discussed earlier when we talked about options for women who have a family or personal history of thrombosis. Um, now, again, with the family history, your absolute risk is going to be much lower. So, but I agree for, for women in my, who attend me after our process of shared decision-making, actually most of my patients offer a, uh, Oil, you know, a, a progesterone releasing device because it's just uh, more reliable from a contraceptive perspective. But of course, the mini pill does not increase in blood pressure. Okay, so if it was your patient, you'd probably go for a progesterone uh, like the Marina Coil or something. It, well, it's it's a it's you know the, it's very much a, a personal patient decision. Yes. And that's been my experience. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. That was really, you covered all the questions. We No more have come in. Um, so it's fantastic. And we will be putting this recorded um, presentation from Professor Fulunyanga on our website next week um, at info at thrombosis.ie. Thank you, Fanula. Thank you.